Welcome all the One Prayer Churches. My name is Francis Chan. I'm a pastor out in Simi Valley, California. And uh, we're going to continue in our series on God is. And I, I want to talk about God's strength today. Um, I have this guy in my church. He is literally the strongest man on earth. Like ESPN puts him on. He is the str- He bench presses over a thousand pounds. Okay, it's like 1,050 pounds that he bench pressed. When we baptized him, we had to turn him sideways. I mean, we really did, because we had this little baptismal, and he's like, uh, you know, and so we just kind of tilted him in, you know. <laughs> like three of us pulled him back out. Uh, but a uh, uh, huge, huge guy. You know, the guys where, you know, they just have, the head just extends. It's just like weird, just, he walks around like this. His wife could beat me up. His wife she bench presses over 275. That's a lot for a girl, okay? Now, I, don't, I haven't met his kids, but I'm assuming they're pretty big, right? I mean, wouldn't it be weird if, if they come out and they've got these scrawny little, you know, kids coming? You'd go, wait a second, that, that doesn't make any sense. And, and that's why I want to talk about the strength of God today is we have this all-powerful, amazing, strong God. And because we don't focus on him enough, I see our churches are, are filled with people who are scared, people who are weak. Uh, powerful is not a term I would use to describe many people who fill churches today. I mean, think about it. How many people in your life would you use that adjective powerful to describe as believers? Uh, I I think it's because we don't think about this characteristic of God. We consequently become weak ourselves. And the more I've focused on his strength and his power, the more I've had the courage to do and to say the things that God wants me to say and do. I I mean, think about it. We grew up with powerful Bible stories. Didn't you love those stories about God's strength? I mean, as a kid, I, I, I grew up kind of, you know, going to Sunday school here and there, and, and I, I'd always look forward like, oh, I hope they tell that David and Goliath story again, right? We all heard that as kids, and we just loved, we loved the way, you know, this little scrawny guy just goes, man, you know, by the power of my God, where is that uncircumcised Philistine? Where is that guy? I'm going to go, and we just love this guy and the power of God taking down this giant. I mean, it's all about strength. I mean, strength is something that characterized the followers of God ever since the beginning of time. Didn't we love the story of of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They said, go ahead, throw us in a fiery furnace. We're, We're not afraid. We don't care. Our God can deliver us. It's about this powerful God. It's about Daniel saying, go ahead, throw me in a lion's den. What, what, what are lions going to do to me? I, I've got the strength of God. I've got God with me. It was about his protection. We all love the story of Elijah. Elijah on Mount Carmel against 450 prophets of Baal. You know, and, 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 and as all these 450 prophets are dancing and screaming out to their God, Elijah is just mocking them because he knows what his God's about to do. And he just gets on his knees and shows them the power of God. Maybe my favorite, uh, for me personally, one of my favorites anyways, is the story of Caleb. You remember Caleb and Joshua, you know, and, and the 12 spies that went out to spy out the land. And, and, and uh, they go and they see, you know, hey, these, these people are huge. These people are massive. They're not gonna be able, we're not going to be able to conquer them. But, but Caleb goes, no, no, let me at them. Let's go. We can do this thing. We can do this thing. Uh, we've got God on our side, and there was this power. There was this confidence. You know, and Josh was like, yeah, he's right. You know, w- with God with us, we can conquer any people. It doesn't matter how big they are. And it was the other ten that were the cowards and the rest of the people that were the cowards. But the believers were always distinguished by their power. And, I, and the thing I love about Caleb is... 45 years later. Remember that? In, uh, in Joshua uh, chapter 14, he, uh, he's 85 years old, and they're about to go to battle. And I love what, what Caleb says. He goes, 
man, I know it's been 45 years and I am 85 years old right now, but I'm as strong as I used to be and I'm ready to go into battle. He's just ready to take control. And you go, man, here's this 85-year-old guy. And he goes, I'll do the same thing I was going to do 45 years ago. I've never stopped believing in my God. And I go, where are the 85-year-olds today that are thinking that way? Where are the 40-year-olds today that are living with that type of confidence, that type of boldness, that type of strength? I want us to look at our lives and evaluate, is this really us? Because Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, a verse that you're probably very familiar with, where he says that God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. That's what our God gave us, a spirit of power of love and self-control. You, you know where this really hit me? It was, it was a few, uh, few months ago. I was just trying to teach through the whole Bible on one Sunday and just kind of nailing you. It, it was, I skipped a few things, but, but you know, just try to just teach through the whole story. And it was one of those times where I, I'm just uh, in some ways, making it up as I go, okay? Because I've read this thing before. So, you know, you're just going, oh, and then this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens, you know, and then I got to Revelation chapter one, and I was reading, you know, the, the fight. I was just talking about, man, how great it is for those of us who conquer. But as I was reading it, it was so convicting because it says here, uh, again, the conqueror in, 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 in uh, Revelation 21, and we talked about the mark of the beast. We talked about those who didn't back down and said, no, I'm not going to take that mark. I don't care. You know, you can torture me. I'll starve to death. I'm not taking that mark. I'm standing strong. And here it is at the end, Revelation 21, verse 7. And he says, the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But then the next verse, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur which is the second death. You see, and I was just reading, and, and it just kind of hit me. I go, wow. The first person he puts on that list are the cowards. The cowards? I, I, I struggled with that because I could think of so many times where I've just been scared. When I know God wants me to say something, and I don't say it. I know he wants me to talk to someone and I don't do it. He wants me, you know, in my prayer time with God, it's like I'll read the word of God and I'll, I'll go, man, this seems like what it says. I got to just go for it. I got to just do it. But then people talk me out of it. I talk myself out of it. There's so many things I want. I just walk away. And yet I look at this, this passage and again, it's going, man, here are the conquerors. That's what believers, followers of God, we should be known as strong because our God is strong. And yet we're not known as that. And so often we're scared. We're cowards. I mean, really, it doesn't make any sense. It's just like I said, just like for that huge couple to have these scrawny kids, if they do, I don't know if they do or not, but it, it would just be weird. And in the same way, if you look at this book, the followers of God, this mighty, all-powerful God, they were conquerors. They were winners. They were fearless. And it's, it's the other side that was the cowards, the ones who didn't have the Spirit of God. And yet I want you to think to yourself, do people see you as powerful? Is that the adjective that they would use in describing you? Because you have such a confidence in your God and you're so sure of what he's able to do through you. As a pastor, I get so concerned because we have people in our church who supposedly have the spirit of the living God, the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead. Okay, the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is now living in them. Not only that, but now they have more resource, more education. You've got every sermon at your fingertips through podcasts. You've got every commentary. You've got everything, and yet people are going, man, I, I can't go talk to my neighbor. 
man, and I'm reading scripture. I'm going, man, here's David going, come on, Goliath. Here's, here, here's Joshua. Here's Caleb. Here's Elijah. Here's Paul. Here's Peter. Here's these uneducated fishermen. They're taking on the world, and yet now we've got so much given to us, and it's like, what? You mean walk across the street and start a relationship with them and tell them about Jesus? Ah, that's, that's a little too much for me. I'll bring them to church. Maybe I'll bring them to church and, and have, have, have someone else tell them about Jesus. We, we have people who have, who have been Christians for, for decades, and they still don't feel equipped to disciple other people. Going, well, I don't want to tell someone to follow my example as I follow Christ. And yet, yet, yet Jesus tells us, that's what I want you to do on this earth. We have couples that have been married for 15, 20, 30 years, and they still go, well, I don't know if I could do premarital counseling. You know, there's a guy in my church, he has a PhD in biblical counseling, and he should do it. Because it's not enough, you know, these years of experience in the Holy Spirit, and plus that I have every sermon in the world at my fingers, that's still not enough for me. I mean, does that really make sense? We're just scared. I get this way. And the crazy thing about it is it seems like the longer I'm in the church setting, the more scared I get. Because you start meeting people that are so gifted, right? And you go, oh, but he's so good, I could never do it like him or like her. And we just start looking at ourselves rather than looking at the Holy Spirit of God. And... I mean, David could have said, man, there's guys that are so much bigger than I am. And everyone in Scripture could have done that. We need to remember who it is that we worship. Remember, God is the creator. God is the creator. We have the creator on our side. Let's think about his power for a moment. I remember there was this, uh, this guy I was sharing my faith with, and uh, he started to mock me. Because he, he says, uh, okay, w- I was playing golf. I was playing golf. We and my buddy were playing golf. And, uh, and so we joined up with this other twosome. And uh, these guys were really good. I mean, they parred, you know, the first two holes. I, I don't do that. And then, uh, <laughs> and then uh, the next hole, one of the guys, you know, hits it into the sand. So I think, oh, it was a par three. and hit into the sand. I go, okay, good. He made a mistake. And... Uh, but then he chipped it out of the sand into the hole for a birdie. So I finally just looked at him and go, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> I go, I play with good guys, but you guys are really good. And one of the guys confessed, he goes, hey, I was on the tour for a while, you know, for like seven, eight years. I'm like, wow, okay. So now I thought I'll never beat him because he's a tour player, but I just want to outdrive him because that's what matters. And uh, <laughs> I just want to hit it farther than him. So that's all I care because I knew I'm not going to beat this guy. I just want to hit further than him every time. So I'm swinging as hard as I can, and pretty soon you see me out driving him on a few holes. And, and then by the end, man, I'm out driving him by, you know, 20, 30, 30 yards. And, it, and now the guy was 73 years old. Um, <laughs> no, but he still hit it far. He was 73. But um, so I'm, uh, as I'm playing, I'm talking to this guy, and, and I'm thinking, you know, I, 73, I got, I got to share with him. <laughs> I don't know if he'll make it to the end of the hole. You know, and uh, <laughs> so I started talking to this guy, and uh, I just asked him, hey, do you believe in God? And he just looks at me, and he goes, you don't bring up God. You don't bring up religion. You don't bring up politics. You don't bring up religion. Don't you know that? Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, now I know. And uh, but it was good, because it got him mad and threw him off his game. And, uh, <laughs> but we... we but I couldn't, I couldn't not say anything. That was one of those times where it's like, no, you got to say something. And I just said, so you don't believe in a God? You know, <laughs> and he's like, he just kind of looks at me. I go, no, honestly, you don't believe. Like, where did all this come from? And he goes, what are you talking about? I go, the trees, the grass. And he goes, gardeners. <laughs> I go, you know what I'm talking about, this whole world. I mean, you think everything that just came from nothing, like there was nothing, and then boom, all this is here? Or just always, exi- I mean, what, you, you gotta believe. He goes, okay, maybe there's a creator. And I'm like, okay, I'll just give you that. <laughs> we played a few more holes, and then I was like, okay, so what do you think about uh, the Bible? And, and he goes, you mean to tell me you believe in the Bible? He goes, that thing is full of so many contradictions. And I was like, tell me one. He goes, okay, here's one. 
do you really believe in Noah's ark? He goes, so you believe that Noah got like two camels to walk onto the ark, and then two cows behind him, and then he got two little ants. Did, did the ants follow him on too? Did he get the ants? Did he talk to the ants? Come on, ants. You know, like just mocking. And, 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 and you know, it, it, I, I'm sorry, my mind's spinning, and then I, I finally just go, I go, okay, listen, I admit, that's hard to believe. Like, how do you get a couple ants onto the boat and termites and, you know, fruit flies, whatever. Um, how do you get them on there? I said, but if you believe in a creator, I said, he, for you and I to think about how can I pull this off, we're talking about something different, because if you believe in a creator, if he can create two ants, are you telling me that he can't make them walk on a boat? I said, for example, I understand it's difficult because I can't create. Like if I tried to create something right now, okay, like watch. I can't. <laughs> I, I can't. You know, it's, it's just this whole idea, but you've got to understand if we're talking about this world that, a, that, that a God speaks into existence, I understand that some of these stories in the Bible, you go, man, could this have happened? Could this have happened? Could this have happened? But if God is a creator, if he made this world, then obviously he can make anything happen upon this earth. And so we've got to understand that and take that back and understand, well, if in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, then what can't he do? I love um, Psalm 115 says it so, so clearly. Psalm 115 verse 3 says this. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. I'm going to say something, maybe the most profound thing I'll say today. God does whatever he wants. There's a being who just does whatever he wants. The Bible says he's, he's not like us. See, I could desire to do something, but it doesn't mean I can pull it off. But there's a being, the Bible says, that does whatever he wants, whatever he desires. And, and I like the way that Daniel expresses it, because Daniel, in chapter 4, Verse uh, 35, he says this. This is King Nebuchadnezzar who says this. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can say to him, what have you done? And no one can hold back his hand. See, it's just a, all of the, here's this, there's this being, I mean, think about this. In heaven, there's this being right now who says that he can look at all of the people. If you gathered every single person on the earth, gathered them all to one spot, the Bible says that that's nothing to him. All of those people are regarded as nothing to him. There's this being up there, he exists, and then there's all these little people, and he goes, that's nothing. And, 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 and it, it says, you know, who can say, who can hold back his hand or who can say, hey, what have you done? Why'd you do this? See, because we don't talk about the power of God, I believe we, we have a generation of people who, who are very arrogant and we do say, hey, God, you're not allowed to do that. You can't do that. You can't tell me this is, wait, do you understand the difference between a creator and a created being? I mean, if I, if I made a little person right now, okay? Hi, hi, hi. You know, I just make this guy. He didn't exist before. He didn't exist before. I just made him. He's here. I, I mean, do you understand the difference between a created being and the creator, the gap between the, the created thing and me? You know, for him to say, I can't do something when I just created him, you know, and that's why, <laughs> see my notes again? You know, that, he's saying, look, Who's going to stop him? Who's going to hold back his hands? You could take everyone on the earth, place him in one spot, and he's just like, big deal. That's nothing to me. I'm God. I'm the creator. I'm the maker. No one can hold back my hand. No one can say to me, what did you just do? And yet we do that all the time. We question him. Why this? Why that? And the answer to that is because he wants to. 
and God's in heaven. He can do whatever he wants. He doesn't need your permission. He doesn't need my permission. God's allowed to do things even if you don't understand them. That's, that's, that's not something we're told very often, that he has the freedom. Because God does something, it's, it's fair, it's right. He doesn't do things because they're fair. Like I tell him, here's what's fair, you've got to stay in these parameters. No, because he does something, it's fair. He sets the parameters. Well, one of my favorite quotes ever, I, I heard it probably 15 to 20 years ago. I was driving in my car, and there was this old preacher. I, I think he was already dead by then. Uh, well, not when he recorded it, but, you know, uh, <laughs> J. Vernon McGee. You guys ever heard J. Vernon McGee? Great, you know, just, just, just old time for you, but I, you know, he's got that little squirrely voice, you know, old man voice, and I, I just loved it because I'm driving, and I hear this, this quote, and I'll, I'll never forget. He, he, goes, he goes, this is God's universe, and God does things his way. You may have a better way, but you don't have a universe. <laughs> Wow, so perfect. That just sums it all up, doesn't it? It's like, well, God, why would you create a place of, uh, you can't create a place of punishment. Well, you can't make it eternal. You can't make it that hard. You can't give me desires and tell me not to do those things. You can't make me like this. You can't. And, and it's like, we all, uh, we all have different ideas of what God ought to do and what you would do if you were God. And I love the way he put it. He just goes, great. When you get a universe, do it that way. You know, but for now, this is God's universe, and no one holds back his hand. We've got to accept that God does what he wants. And there needs to be a sense of reverence for this power of God again. You know, in uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul uh, reminds Timothy in verse 15, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. He says, understand that there's only one sovereign. Sovereign, meaning having control. There's only one person that's like that. None of us have control. There's only one being who has control, absolute control. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. It doesn't matter how, how successful, how powerful you think you are. There's only one. He's the king over you, no matter who you are. He's a lord over you. It doesn't matter who you are. He's the only sovereign who alone has immortality. Think about this. He alone has immortality. I just took a breath because he let me. I just took another one because he let me. He's, he's in control of this thing called life. He's the only one that's the giver of life. We, he determines whether or not you, you walk, out of, walk out of this room today. It's all up to him. He's the only one that can give life. He's the only one that takes it away. It's all up to him. Man, do you understand that Satan is only alive because God allows him to be? Think about this for a second. There's one being. He possesses all power, all life. Every demon would die the moment he he chooses to take their life away. He alone is immortal. So what are you going to say to that God? You're going to tell him he's not allowed to do something? You're going to talk about, you see, that's where we've become so arrogant because we forget, wait, no, there's only one being who gives life. One being who is sovereign. One being who is in control. And it's by his grace that I'm breathing right now. And it says that he dwells in unapproachable light. Unapproachable light. The Bible says that somehow he's clothed in light. He's like, it, like if we were to look at him right now, we would just die. Because no human being can look at him and live. So if you've got a being up there who dwells in unapproachable light, who has all control, who is the only immortal one, who is the only true ruler, who is king over all of us. And yet, we can get so arrogant and question that being, and we forget about his power, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. I want to turn to you one more passage. Isaiah 45, this one, oh, I loved it. You know, I, I was uh, studying, uh, it was back around Easter time, and I was uh, 
studying Philippians 2, you know, about, about Christ coming down and, and, and then going back up and one day every knee would bow. And then it cross-referenced the Old Testament because that, that comes from the Old Testament in Isaiah 45. In Isaiah 45, verse 22, it says, Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. God says, I'm, I'm the only God there is. So you turn to me and you be saved. But then he makes a statement. He goes, by myself I have sworn. Some translations say, I swear to myself. By myself. Because you know when you, when you swear, and you shouldn't swear. You guys don't swear. But, but people who swear, what do they swear by? They go, I swear to God, right? I swear to God. Why? But then what does God do? God goes, I swear to myself. <laughs> go, That's pretty awesome. That is pretty awesome. Like there's, what, what's, what are you going to swear? We want to swear by the greatest power in existence. And God looks at, isn't that amazing that we have a God in, in heaven right now that goes, I swear to myself because there's nothing greater. I'm the only God, I swear to myself. And he goes, what does he swear? He goes, and from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. In other words, he goes, when I swear, when I say something's going to happen, it happens. See, you guys say things are going to happen and it's 50-50, right? You know, and, and you know, you say something, but you have no control. And God goes, when I say something, it happens. And he goes, and I am swearing to myself right now. And it's coming out of my mouth, so you know it's going to happen. He says, says, to me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. God says, I swear to you by my own name. And when I say something, it happens. One day, every single created thing is going to bow to me. And everyone's going to recognize that I'm God. And I don't know what that does for you. I think there was a time in my Christian walk when I almost feared that power. But now it's like my greatest security. Because if that God is for me, who's going to be against me? See, you know, by not talking about the power of God, we lose our security. See, I'm going to look pretty stupid on this earth for a while. I just will. With my morality, what I believe, and because I hold to this book, I'm going to look dumb in front of a lot of people. I'm going to talk about this Jesus who died for their sins, and many people are going to reject that. But, but, but back in my mind and deep in my heart, I know, you know what, but one day that day's going to come and that God's going to come down and I'm going, yeah, see, that's a God that I'm on his side. And he swore there when he was going, so I'm going to bow now. And it's just it's this amazing, amazing thought that we have a God that, that's, that is that powerful and ought to cause us to have some courage to be his children and to know that he put his spirit in us. See, here's what I'd love to see happen through this. One more passage, and I'm done. Joshua 1. Joshua 1, verse 6. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law of Moses, all the law that my that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it from the right or left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Over and over again, he says, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, be strong and very courageous, don't be afraid. Over and over in scripture, something that, that, that should typify us, should characterize us is this strength, this courage. I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid because of the spirit that's in me right now. And I'm just longing for the day that when I'm discouraged or I feel defeated, when I'm going, oh man, this is too tough, that people in church don't just come up to me and put their arm around me and, and cry with me and say, oh, I'm sorry, you know it's tough. Why don't you take a vacation? Why don't you get more family time? 
Why don't you sleep a little bit more? Why don't you? I'm longing for the day when would someone just come up to me and go, you know what? You're a powerful person. The Holy Spirit of God is in you. I know it was difficult, but be strong and courageous. When do we as believers get together and gather and encourage each other to be strong? When I see the New Testament, man, it said that Peter and John, they astonish people with their boldness. And yet when they broke out of jail, the believers got together and prayed more boldness. I see the Apostle Paul, the boldest guy on earth, in Ephesians 6, 19 and 20, going, you know what? Pray for me that I could preach the word boldly like I ought. It's about boldness. It's about strength. And we, as the body of Christ, we need to get together again, lay hands on each other, and pray for boldness and strength and remind each other that we have an almighty God who's going to come back and every knee is going to bow. He swore to himself it's going to happen. And so for now, we may look stupid, but stay on his side. Uh, do everything this book says. Let's, let's live it. Let's walk it. Let's encourage each other for boldness, power, strength, that the church of Jesus Christ would once again be known as strong, bold, courageous. Let me pray for you. God, would your Holy Spirit fall on us and give us boldness again. Make us like you, all-powerful God. May we reflect you. You are strong, so we ought to be also by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.